and start the slideshow. All right. <laughs> okay. So quickly, if you guys have not been to one of these um, DBT skills sessions before, as you can see by the setup, it's going to just be education based. So think like lecture. If anyone has questions, if I'm moving too fast, which totally tends to happen, I get really excited about stuff like this. Um, if you can't hear us, like anything like that, type it right in the chat. I'm going to try my very best to be mindful and I'm going to ask Kaylin to be extra mindful of it. So Kaylin, feel free to interrupt me. I'm happy to be interrupted um, if something needs our attention. So please let me know. Um, and I feel like that's it. So let's dive in with our introductions. I will start. So my name is Ashley. I am one of our therapists here at DBT of South Jersey. I've been working here um, <clears throat> going on, not quite, but close to three years at this point. Um, got introduced to DBT almost six years ago in different capacities. Um, I mostly see adults, but I do see some teens, which is a lot of where this information came from, a training based on families and teens. Um, I guess that's like short and sweet. So excited, like so freaking out. I'm so excited to do this. All right, Kaylin, brief introduction. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Kaylin. I am an intern at DBT of South Jersey. And I just started there a little while ago at the end of May. Um, and I'm working towards my master's in clinical mental health counseling from the College of New Jersey um, and should graduate there um, next May. Um, and I have been learning all about all the DBT things um, and just really diving in and I've loved, I've loved learning so much about it um, and from all the wonderful commissions here, including Ashley, um, and I'm just happy to be with you all. I'm another TCNJ person up in here. That's pretty cool. Ooh, that is cool. Very cool. Go Lions. <laughs> <sighs> Roar. Roar. Absolutely. Jacqueline's going to be active in the chat, keeping us, yeah, keeping us ready to go. I'm excited for that. All right, guys, let's dive in to announcements now. So a lot of this stuff is ongoing. I just want everyone to very much take advantage of it as much as you can. So we have a couple of free workshops every single month, just in case you did not know. This is, of course, one of them. So the next time this is running in August, it's going to be happening on the 11th. It's going to be with our, her formal title is administrative assistant, but really she's like a wizard. Like she just kind of does everything. She's the best. Her name is Kelly Sue. She's going to be running the workshop here on how your space impacts your emotional well-being. I'm really considering signing up for that myself. Um, other free workshops that occur every month, again, just in case people are not aware, is I personally run a um, family support and education-based workshop at the end of every month. So the next time that's happening is Monday, July. I was confusing myself. Monday, July 25th. That happens at 7.15 and it runs for one hour. Our free yoga workshop run by Alex is next happening on Monday, August 1st. That happens at 6 p.m. Um, all of those are free, like I said, and you'll sign up for it just about the same exact way you sign up for this, just with a different tab um, under the events tab on our main website. And again, recordings are going to be emailed out roughly around the weekend. And I think we're ready to dive in. I am... Excited. Okay, I just have to organize my screen and stuff. All right, here we go. Bear with me. I cannot really tell you the last time I had to do like a whole slideshow thing. It's been a little minute. All right, I think we're good. Does everything look good, Kaylin? You can see everything. Look good. Great. Okay. Yep. I know these slides are so cute. I did not make them, so I'm not taking credit. But relationship mindfulness. Again, they are. I so cute, Kaylin and myself, but um, really stressing the training that I went to that I'm adapting all of this from was by Alice, Alan Frizzetti, who really big in the adolescent DBT world. So he ran this training on the next slide here. He ran this training last year. He runs it fairly frequently, but I attended it last year um, on how to do DBT with parents, couples, and families. And it just talked to, again, like 
it was a four day long training. So I'm condensing four days into one hour, which is exciting and stressful. So I could do like eight parts of this, but, um, he talked about all of the different ways to, again, adapt, individualize DBT as we typically would see it to work with more than one person, parents of teens, baby couples, families, things like that. So I wanted to talk just for a second about, again, just for the people who might not be familiar about some of the ways that individual adult, individual teen and individual family DBT therapy would look. Um, Cause they do differ a little bit and I will not be able to do it justice just given the time that we have right now, but brief introduction, think about it like that. Um, individual adult, as it works at DBT of South Jersey, there's a tiny bit of variation, but individual adult DBT, they attend one weekly individual session with their therapist, one group session with two therapists in that group as their group leaders individual teen at DBT of South Jersey. The teen is the main client and they attend a multifamily DBT skills group. So the teen attends um, one individual session by themselves each week. Family can be involved, of course, as needed at that point too. Um, And then again, the group that they attend will happen with the teen and at least one parent or caregiver. Sometimes both parents like to join. That's totally fine, which is why it's called multifamily group. Because again, it's the teen and at least one parent versus family-based DBT treatment. Um, And there's a lot of ways to adapt this. This can be supplemental to individual DBT. This can happen when someone's done comprehensive DBT. It's really kind of free to tailor to whatever is needed for the person. Um, Lots of freedom here. A couple of the main goals, um, focusing on when the family is involved in general, when family DBT is happening is increasing the capabilities of everybody, giving everybody the skills and tools that they need to be more effective in their relationships and, of course, in their own lives, increasing everybody's motivation, um, willingness and motivation to continue doing work like this because this work, if you've been in therapy ever, it's hard. It's, like, really hard. And even if you haven't, that's okay. You might understand that too, but it's hard. So to keep and maintain motivation to continue on, increasing skill generalization to the environment. So that just means taking whatever skills are learned in any individual sessions or family sessions or any group sessions, being able to take those skills and apply them to your life when they're actually needed. So think about like, if you ever went to college, hold on, that's a little bit about what Kaylin's doing right now, going to school to learn how to do counseling. And now Kaylin, among other things, she's working to generalize those counseling skills with people in real life. Good example. Um, Structuring the environment to encourage progress, keeping things effective, boundaries, communication, rules and expectations, things like that. Just making the environment more effective and enhancing therapist capabilities and motivation to treat people who are really, really struggling. So um, DBT consultation, team meeting. So So think team meeting, but with a very, I don't know how to word that. Think about a team meeting or consulting about clients and things like that, making sure that we are doing the very best possible job that we can with a really structured DBT spin on it. I think that's probably the best way to say it. Um, okay. That's it for this. Why is working with family important? Just a couple of things. Um, Kaylin, is your phone ringing on your thing, on your computer? Nope. Nope. It's mine? I'm hearing something. I don't know what it is, though. It stopped. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm hoping that didn't, the sound didn't record. It's, like, in my ear. Um, why working with the family is important. Family sessions are, of course, one way to generalize skills, which I think is a really big reason why at least one parent is involved in that multifamily skills group. If the teen has skills, plus the parent can be aware of the skills, it's just going to be more conducive to everyone being more skillful. Family members are often having a really hard time too, even if they're not the one struggling with whatever the mental health issue might be. Um, And most of the time, like the vast majority of the time, family members of someone who's really struggling, they want to do better. Um, They're very often, unfortunately, villainized by professionals, 
professionals are people too and have lots of judgments. Um, so they really do need help and their own support too. And we do tend to see higher rates of PTSD and other issues among family members. So think in very much a more extreme, from a more per extreme perspective, if, um, I was gonna say a teen, I'm gonna stop picking on teens for just a second. But if someone in the family has a suicide attempt or a hospitalization or self-harm or any level of really significant mental health struggles, you could totally see PTSD be prevalent in other family around that individual because that's really scary. So again, family members need support too. Um, family improvements and involvement can often lead to better client outcomes for the person individually. And data really does support that family interventions of any kind, for the most part, positively impact the client outcomes and overall family well-being. My favorite part, any family involvement is typically helpful. So even if it's like at my last job, we didn't have the opportunity just with the level of care that it was, we didn't really have a ton of opportunity to like dive deep and talk about like family dynamics. It was more just education and here's how you can support them at this higher level of care. If that only happens once, still helpful, still worth doing. Um, and even if DBT alone is the only thing that's happening, even if there is no family involvement formally, research will still support changes in family chaos and relationships in the family, even if one, only one person is getting the formal DBT-based help. So pretty amazing. So honestly, all of you here, of course, I don't know why everyone's here specifically, what the reasons might be, but if you are here because you know someone in your life who is struggling, or maybe you're that person who's struggling, you being here once automatically gonna help in some way, give you more insight and knowledge, give you an idea on some things to do differently. So good first step. All right, and as always, I don't know if I said this in the beginning, I think I did. If there's any questions about any slides or anything like that, throw them in the chat, just. Another plug for that. Happy to be interrupted. That's the next one, right? Okay. So two, this is one of them, but two main, like, not necessarily skills, but there's two main components that I wanted to talk more about today. Transactional model is one of them. And then we're going to end with relationship mindfulness, which is, is, of course, why you guys all came here today. But I think that the transactional model is really, really important to understand because as we'll talk about with the transactional model in just a second, it really does, like everything flows in together and everything's important. So this is going to be good to understand before we dive into relationship mindfulness more um, formally here in just a second. So let this, like this is a back and forth. There's not necessarily a starting point. There's not necessarily an ending point. This is very much a cycle that can go back and forth. So for the sake of explaining, we'll start with somebody who has high emotional vulnerability, meaning more sensitive to emotions. Um, that can look like a lot of different ways. Maybe they were born more sensitive to emotions. Maybe they didn't sleep well last night, so they're more irritable. Maybe they're coming to you immediately after a really big argument with their friend or partner, emotionally vulnerable to some extent. Um, and that same person, their emotional dysregulation. So however that emotional vulnerability looks, so whether that's crying or verbally snapping at someone or name calling or shutting down with their mood, like they maybe feel more depressed or they look more depressed, something like that, some sort of feeling and then expression of that emotion often leads to an invalidating response from a friend, a family member, and how's that gonna make the initial person feel? I'm really struggling. I'm probably having a really hard time communicating it. And then they get invalidated for that. Why are you overreacting? Oh my God, you're such a baby. Knock it off, it wasn't even that big of a deal. It's not gonna make them feel any better. So this cycle is gonna just keep continuing. The, other, the initial person's emotional response is gonna get bigger because they didn't get the validation that they needed, which is gonna bounce back to another invalidating response, which bounces back, like it just, keeps getting worse, more intense, I should say, it keeps getting more and more intense. And it really is a cycle. Um, right in the middle here, emotional reactivity and slow return to baseline causes stress and strain with others. They invalidate. And then again, the cycle is maintained. 
What I mean by slow return to baseline is it takes an especially long time for someone with ongoing emotional vulnerability or anyone, depending on the day, takes them an especially long time compared to average to return to their emotional baseline, which means where they are emotionally, their version of normal. So for some people, their version of normal, how they live most of their life on an average day could be like a little bit anxious. Overall, I'm okay. I'm feeling a little bit anxious. Like if it's your version of normal and you can live that way, that might be your baseline, your emotional baseline. High emotional reactivity, little things might set this person off or that's how it seems to you. And it takes a really long time for them to come back to their version of normal. Again, would cause stress and strain with others. And then this cycle goes back and forth and continues. Um, next section here about dialectics. So it is the D in DBT. If you do not know, dialectics, dialectical. Dialectics are two opposing things can be true at the same time. And it really is like, if you think about the ocean at any given point, the waves are coming up and the waves are going down. Like the waves affect the shore, the shore affects the waves, the waves are affected by the moon, like everything is interacting with each other. Again, there's not so much a solid like start and end to any of those interactions too. So that's kind of what it's like here. Um, and because of that, there's really no reason to blame anybody in particular. Like, yes, the person who's invalidating could totally provide more validation and they could totally be more understanding. They probably need to learn how to do that, but like they're probably not doing it on purpose. And the person who's having the emotional dysregulation or the highly reactive emotions, they could totally learn how to feel their emotion in a different way. They can totally learn how to cope with it. Again, they have to learn, they have to practice and they have to be taught, but whose fault is it? No one's because it's, everything's kind of blending together. There's no like harsh lines in this. Hoping all of this makes sense. Um, this last section here, educating families on this helps to make sense of their experiences without blame, give choices for how to proceed. It's just, again, important to know um, if you're in an interaction with someone, this will a thousand percent come up more when we get into relationship mindfulness more specifically. Um, but if you're in an interaction with someone and you remember like, hold on a second, it's like the waves and how the waves flow. It's no one's fault. There's no start. There's no stop. It's both of us. It, I think that it takes a little bit of the heat off of why are they doing this to me? Or I'm so terrible because I responded that way. I hope that that makes sense. If it doesn't, again, as always, let me know. Um, Kaylin, do you have any thoughts, questions, anything on your mind about any of this so far or just reactions or anything? Um, I love the metaphor of the ocean and the, the beach oh, and metaphor. the rest. Love a good metaphor, especially <laughs> beach, especially beach ones is painting a nice picture. Um, I think that's a really good way of explaining it there really is no um blame I think we can can all be be better in our own ways and yeah mm -hmm. and I think there's also a really important thing that can happen with like person a over here I think that you can see my mouse can you see my mouse in the ring? I can cool I'm like yeah. I don't know what technology is doing if you, um, okay imagine that person a and then person b they're both talking to somebody about the interaction like but they shouldn't have done this and they should have validated or they shouldn't have yelled at me first of all they did like that thing happened so now what are we going to do moving forward and also you yelled at them or also you invalidated them so like it just all makes sense like I wouldn't really expect without more skills without more understanding and it's even way more complicated than that like how else could people do things differently if they weren't taught you know what I mean Right, exactly. Cool. All right. If there are no questions, we'll keep her moving here. <sighs> Different variation of our transactional model here about the actual situation and what happens here. This little bolded part, I'm going to draw your attention to just really quickly, and I will loop back around to it, but I just want to say like this particular section here is more geared to the job of a therapist um like if people can you can do this you can do this with practice with education and all of that kind of stuff anyone I think is capable of 
prompting for the primary motion and all of that. Um, however, mainly the job of the therapist to pull that out if the people are having a hard time and just thought it would be good to keep in there. Um, if needing to address any issues to understand again, to understand the emotion more than anything, rather than the thoughts that are clinging to it or clouding around. Another metaphor is brewing. I really hope that metaphors are helpful. We can tend to throw quite a lot out there, but it would almost be like, <laughs> I'm thinking of my backyard. I have like so many wasps and I don't even know <laughs> where they're all coming from <laughs> so like that's the thing like even just if we leave it at that getting clinging to the thoughts and the judgments that can come up as the result of an emotion is like if I was only ever focused on getting rid of the wasps like okay sure that's relevant like they're totally a part of this and without figuring out where they are coming from it's going to keep happening without understanding where they're coming from problem solving that whole thing which I We'll stop the metaphor here because I don't know what that looks like for wasps, but <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, so typically with our transactional model, what we would have is, of course, an event. I walk in to see Kaylin. She's my mom. We're pretending. She says, hi, honey, how was your day? And I say, terrible, mom. Leave me alone. What's going to happen for Caitlin? She's going to say something like, go to your room. Go to your room. Don't ever talk Don't to talk me, to me like that. that. Totally. Like a thousand percent. She is a human. Valid. And she just got talked to like that for, she didn't do anything wrong. And she got talked to like that. So of course she would have judgments, which would increase how intense her emotion feels, which could increase, I don't know. It doesn't have to be any of these specific behaviors, but it could be some type of, following the kid up to her room and screaming in her face sort of behavior, whatever that might look like, or the other way around. Um, I walk in and I'm the teen. Hi mom. How are you? Fine. And then she slams the cabinet door. I would have judgments. I would get really upset, increased emotional arousal. I could react in one of these ways again. Like we're always affecting each other, mm -hmm. always back and forth. How I'm coming into this room right now, even though I can't see anyone else's faces other than myself and Kaylin, still being affected by everything. I was affected by the chat when Jacqueline was typing things in there. We're always affecting each other, sometimes in a big way, sometimes in a not big way. And yet we always are. Um, other things to keep in mind here, again, goes back to that high emotional vulnerability piece of things, which totally includes temperament and biology, how we're born, if we're more sensitive, some people feel emotions more deeply. That is really not a bad thing. It's just a thing. Um, lacking please skills for the sake of time. I don't think I can go too much into please skills today, but just know it is all of the physical ways that we take care of ourselves. So making sure we don't have any physical ailments and we're keeping up on doctor's appointments, taking meds as prescribed, eating enough, sleeping enough, exercising enough. If those things are off, it totally makes us more vulnerable. Um, what is it? Almost 5.30. If I forgot to eat today, hanger mm -hmm. is real. That's just one piece of it too, right? So if any of those things are happening, plus an event, plus the judgments that can go along with it, someone's going to get upset. Someone is going to get really upset again, which could lead to some sort of dysregulation or impulsive behaviors to some extent or another. Um, the goal here is to, I just wanna make sure I'm not getting too ahead of myself here. Give me one second, okay. Goal here is to identify the primary emotion, which is going to occur like here. When we have an emotion, I need to write like a math equation, very formal math equation here. I'm gonna write it in the chat. Here we go. Try to remember this, you're gonna be quizzed later. Emotion plus judgment equals not primary emotion. That's really what it is. So I'm trying to think of how deep in this rabbit hole to go down to. This is what I'm talking about, guys. <laughs> like four days worth of stuff in an hour. Because it's all important. Maybe I'll do like a part two of this or something like that. But yeah. be on the lookout for this. Um, 
It doesn't mean that the not primary or secondary emotion that the person is having, it doesn't mean that's not valid. It doesn't mean that we want to ignore it or it's crazy. It's nothing like that. But in order to help the person, in order for the person to get as much understanding and validation as possible, we really need to hone in on that primary emotion. What this might look like for our specific, like I'm the team, Kaylin's the mom example here. Let's pretend it's me. I'm the team. I walk in. Hi, mom. Kaylin says, hi, or don't talk to me right now. Whatever she says, something like a little bit stern, not totally warm, and immediately slams one of the cabinets. What's my initial primary emotion is I'm not having judgments. I'm not evaluating the situation yet. What's my first feeling going to be? Sadness, hurt, confusion, something like that. And then I go into why the, would she talk to me like that? I didn't do anything wrong. She shouldn't have done that, which is going to lead to what? I'm stewing and I'm angry and I'm a teenager. So I have vulnerabilities and I'm just pissed. I'm getting upset. Yeah. So mm -hmm. could turn into all sorts of things. But if I'm going to go have a conversation with Kaylin, who is pretend my mom, I wouldn't want to say, mom, that was so horrible of you to do that. I would want to really pull back and be like, mom, it really hurt my feelings that you did this. Because my message is going to get lost if I'm coming at it from a highly emotional, secondary emotion perspective. My mom might be able to hear me here, mm -hmm. but that's not really what's most important. It's important because I was hurt and I wish that she didn't do that, but she did. It really hurt my feelings that you did that. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. Here's what happened. I'll be mindful of that moving forward. Then I'm going to get the validation I need. I'm going to get like the true apology for the true thing that I felt like was done wrong to me and all of that. Okay. I'll give you guys a second for the chat. If there's any questions, this is like a little bit of an intermission period. I have some questions I'm going to throw up here. Before we do that, are there any questions that people want to throw into the chat? I'm going to get that um, math equation there tattooed on me. Emotion <laughs> plus judgments, not primary. We can get matching one. I know. That would be kind of <laughs> cool. The dedication. We would never be able to do a therapy that's like not DBT because of where right. this originated. Anyway. <laughs> All righty. Let's see. My question's really valuable. Awesome. Thanks. I won't keep repeating myself. If that changes and there are questions, let us know. Cool. All righty. Next here, I do, I would love any and all questions answered in the chat. Whoever does not mind sharing, you do not have to answer all of these, just like a little bit about what you think, but here are some questions. Have you ever reacted someone out of emotion and later regretted how you spoke to them or regretted the words that you said? Have you ever called someone a name, like a not kind name, not like sweetheart, like an unkind name or made an overgeneralized inaccurate statement about them or to them during an interaction. You never do this, you always say that. Last one here, do you have ongoing difficulty communicating with others, even if it's just one person in particular, especially when your emotions are high? So feeling like you're not understanding each other, we are just not getting each other. Like this isn't moving anywhere, we're talking in circles. Or one or, one or both of you gets defensive or avoidant, like we won't talk about it. Kaylin will like totally just not talk about it and we'll be fine, it's gonna be fine. Any of those things relevant? And I would be shocked if anyone said no to all of these because of being a human. All three, totally. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Who else is out there? Anyone else here and want to let us know if you've ever struggled with any of these things? Yeah. Or anyone like, nope, I never have. And if so, we're going to switch and you're going to leave this and you're going to tell us how. <laughs> Just kidding. That would be really impressive. It's totally possible. Right. Okay. Unfortunately, very normal. Because really dealing with our emotions is something that we have to be taught. Like, I, I really don't think people are born knowing, like, hold on, this is primary. And I think that I should communicate this to this person that I'm feeling this emotion with. Like, there, where, did, where would that come from? We have to be taught it, whether it's from our parents who know about it or a therapist if we're in therapy or whoever. We do need to be taught. I have fantastic parents. They didn't teach me. They would have if they knew. 
it would have a plain name, but. Yeah. All right, now the good stuff. We all came for relationship mindfulness. So with families, couples, um, families, couples, what am I missing? Teens, families, couples. Um, relationship mindfulness is the core skill. It is so literally think about it at the core. Think about the seed that's being planted is relationship mindfulness and anything and everything comes out of that. And that needs to be the center of everything. Maintaining awareness of the transaction during any interaction with somebody else. So again, remember that transactional model. It is like, someone keep a tally of how many times I say mindful (laughs) and probably transaction too. (laughs) It is carrying around the mindfulness and awareness that this transaction is happening and it's always happening while the transaction is happening. It exists and it's existing right now. Um, So what this could look like is actively paying attention to the person in the moment, not multitasking, eye contact, not checking your phone, not thinking about what you're going to say next, not waiting for them to finish their sentence. Like you are totally with them. The only job you have is to pay attention to the person, whatever they're doing, whatever they're saying. And again, being mindful during that experience. So what are you doing and saying, how do you feel about them? Um, This is a little bit my favorite part of all of this, because again, if you've ever related to any of these things on this question list here, not that you forgot that you cared about the person, but that is typically not the very first thing on your mind when you're in an argument or a disagreement. I think you know you like them or love them, depending on who the person is, but it's not the first thing that's on your mind. Your emotion is probably the first thing on your mind. If any formal thoughts are even on your mind because the emotion might just be too intense for that. So again, this is like taking all of these mindfulness pieces and like carrying them with you in all of these interactions. How do you feel about them? They are my insert relationship here. This is my daughter. I love her. Do I want to be talking to her like this? Is this the relationship that I want for us? Probably not, depending on how bad it can get, right? Or how ineffective it can get. So again, it's really keeping all of those important details at the forefront, letting the relationship be at the forefront, your thoughts and feelings about the relationship. Embracing myself for how difficult this next one is. Letting go of past experience and any memories. Last time I had this conversation, she said, blah, 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 or we've been talking about this issue for six months. I'm so sick of talking about it. This is a new experience and treat it like a new experience. Even if some patterns repeat, it's still a new experience. You are not a thousand percent the same person in any interaction. We're evolving and changing all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Letting go of anything past, anything that might be like, I have a new metaphor brewing, guys. Who's keeping track of the metaphors? Who's keeping track of the metaphors? Me. (laughs) Like something latching onto you. You know how like a kid like a, I don't know, like a four-year-old or something, if they really want to spend time with you, they'll latch onto your ankles. Mm -hmm. Imagine that that's happening. Like your past experience, memories, resentments, all of those things are trying to latch onto your ankles and you're trying to be as mindful as you can to go into it without anything other than the moment, other than what's happening right now. So it'd be like, respectfully, kid, you have to get off my ankle. Um, it would also be remembering any long-term relationship goals. So again, if this is someone that you care about and you want them to stay in your life and you want a healthy and balanced relationship with them, slamming the door in their face, calling them names, all of those things are not, even if they're not total deal breakers, probably not going to be conducive to the relationship that you might want with them. Number one, my favorite thing ever treating things like us versus the problem, not you versus me. We're not against each other. Again, if the relationship mindfulness skill is the core skill, that means the relationship is pretty much the most important thing. So how are we going to fix anything if we're so much against each other? If we're butting heads like this, I guess maybe it's not impossible. I don't want to speak in too many extremes here, but it's just going to be really hard. It's going to be hard to solve things if you're at each other or ineffective or not using direct language or reacting to the secondary emotion or whatever. So it really needs to be like us sitting on the same side of the couch, looking at the problem and figuring out how to deal with it 
as opposed to, again, opposing here. <sighs> role play time. Kayla and I are gonna do a role play. It's gonna be super quick, um, but I mostly just want to, first of all, explain. I think that you guys probably know because I, I'm sure that you've lived it in some way, at least once, but I just wanna explain and show how quickly that this can happen even if people, again, even if they're probably doing their very best and they're not doing these things on purpose, it can still happen. So let's say Kaylin is the teen. I am the mom. Here are the details from Kaylin's day that I do not know about. I'm home, getting dinner ready, doing whatever. Kaylin's coming home from school. Here's what happened. Earlier in the day, Kaylin had an argument with her whole friend group sometime at school. She got a test grade back and she got a D. She's someone who really values her grades. So this is like, a, really hits her here. Mm -hmm. um, she comes home. I say, hi. She snaps. I snap back. So Kaylin, you feel free to snap. However, teenage Kaylin would snap. And I will channel my future mother. If I'm ever a mother of a human one day and I will channel that and we will react. Sound good? Sounds great. You're walking in. Hi, Kaylin. How was your day? Mom, just don't. Just don't. I'm not in the mood. I'm in the mood for what? You literally just got home. I I don't want you to ask questions about my day. I just I just keep making dinner. Just I don't I don't want to talk right now. Kaylin, what you're not gonna do is tell me what to do to keep making dinner. I'm your mom. I can't even ask about your day. That doesn't make any sense. No, I got home from school and I just had a really bad day and now I get home and you're just like asking me questions and I don't want to talk about it. Okay, I asked you one question. So now you're going to go up to your room and we're really not going to talk about it. Bye. I don't want to go. I don't want to go to my room. Okay, well, you're not going to sit here and talk to me like that. So just go somewhere then. Whatever. You're being so unfair right now. Whatever. Bye and scene good job we're being nominated for emmys um <laughs> what do we think happens next what happens as a result of an interaction like that feel free to write it in the chat kaylin if you've got thoughts please share them came at each other a little bit that could have been worse i'm proud of us for not yelling too much could have been worse so we came at each other a bit let's say kaylin like throws her backpack down and goes to another room or whatever I'm stewing over whatever I'm cooking. What happens to us then? Our relationship. What are the repercussions or the consequences of that sort of interaction? I would probably not want to come to dinner, even though you've been, you know, working hard at it all day and just want to give me a good meal, but I'd be... <laughs> pissed at you and I would not want to I wouldn't want to spend time with you um for the rest of the night and since you know teens maybe it will um carry over you know and like linger mm -hmm. and last um for longer than it should um, mm -hmm. yeah and the parent's not going to want to spend very much time with you either I asked one question. Why are you coming at me like that? Right. Why are you both people? Out? Yeah, like, dude, relax. And you're like, why do you keep asking me so many questions? <laughs> it's back and forth. <laughs> both people avoid each other. Kayla never talks about her actual problem. It creates distance. Probably won't end up resolving this. Mm. Just forget it ever happened. We're just gonna like let it breeze over. I'll invite her to dinner maybe tomorrow, or I'll just like scream upstairs, Kayla, dinner's ready, and we'll just pretend it never happened. But you're exactly right. She never talks about her actual problem, which is totally about like, mom, I felt really blah, 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 blah. This is what happened. I need space right now. Oh my God, I'm so sorry that happened. Let me know when you're ready to talk would have been like amazing from both sides. Um, but again, it's not, it's really not on one person. Kaylin, even though she's a teen, is a little bit responsible for managing her own emotions and responses. Teens need help. Adults need help. And I need to realize, like, <clears throat> especially if I know my kid and if this is unusual, even if it's not unusual, it's coming from somewhere. 
So like, whoa, like the example here, like, what's the matter? You seem really upset. What's going on? And even if it was still a little bit too loud or had some attitude or whatever you want to say, Kaylin would probably say, I just had a really bad day. I don't feel like talking right now. And I would say, okay, like go take some time to yourself. Then let me know when you're ready to talk. Not that I have to be like, it's okay to talk to me however you want. Please curse at me all you, it doesn't have to be like that. It's just also not a good time to figure it out. The details of it right now. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Does all of that make sense? Slash, are there any questions? I'm gonna go to the next slide, but I will be mindful of the chat here. Um, I lied, I'm not getting too ahead of myself. Something that I wanted to say here about all of this is just because like, if you make the commitment to be more mindful and intentional in your interactions, again, if I'm the mom, Kaylin still talks like somewhat disrespectful toward me. I'm not gonna address it in the moment because she's already upset how effective is it gonna be? That doesn't mean that I don't have to address or that I can never address the way that she spoke to me. You know what I mean? When things are calmer, Kaylin hopefully will come to me and say, mom, I'm really like, so that was crazy. Like, sorry about earlier. Um, here's what happened. The thing with the friends, I got that grade back. I really thought I did better. She and I would talk about it. We would be better. All like the conflict would be resolved, hopefully. And then I would say, okay, just like one last thing. It really upset me that you talked to me like that. Do you think there's a different way? that you could communicate to me that you need space or that you're having a bad day. Like, I'm really not okay with the way you spoke to me. I'm happy you're telling me now, but can we figure out something different? Um, something, it doesn't even have to be specifically like that, but something along those lines. Um, cool, all right. Let, please go to the next slide, okay. Um, second part of this relationship mindfulness also relies on I could do a whole thing on accurate expression mm -hmm. relies on accurate <laughs> expression of your emotion again based on the primary emotion I'm disappointed that you're late versus you're so inconsiderate I've been waiting for you for forever you're this you're that again before we label the judgments <clears throat> before we ruminate on the feelings what's there the emotion and how do we accurately express that because again, if Kaylin and I, let's pretend we're friends in this next world that we're in here. We meet up, we're at dinner, except she's not there yet and I'm waiting for her and it's an hour and a half. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. An hour and a half later, she's here. What's the initial emotion? Maybe disappointed, maybe sad, maybe worried that something happened to her. But the more I stew on it, the more it's gonna turn into like, she's a, insert, <laughs> unkind word here. And I'm gonna get, I'm going to get upset. I'm going to get really angry. But again, then my message is going to get lost if she finally shows up and I'm laying into her or ignoring her or some sort of ineffective expression of my feeling, right? She's not going to get it. She's going to get frustrated. And then again, we're going to be in that back and forth transactional model of invalidation, dysregulation, back and forth over and over again. So it's the commitment for the person to stay with the primary emotion and express it in that accurate and genuine way. If you're sad, crying's not totally genuine to everyone, but if you're sad about something and your body wants to cry with a safe person that you trust, you might allow yourself to cry and be like, I'm really sad that this happened. I'm really disappointed as opposed to like <laughs> shoving that emotion away and having your secondary emotion. I don't think we always do that on purpose. I think our emotions are really smart and quick sometimes and it just happens. But the best way, the most effective way that we're gonna get the validation that we need and be heard the way that we need to be heard is if we accurately express our primary emotions, our true like at the core of everything emotions. That's the most effective way. Um, and again, all of that can break down the cycle of communication breakdown or difficulties communicating, which leads to more invalidation if we can really slow that down um this is super quick here because i wish more than anything that there was more time in a day um but in order to accurately express your emotion you need to be able to do all of these things perfectly no but at least a little bit you got to be able to do these things you have to manage your emotion you have to know and see it when it's happening you have to not judge yourself for having it. You have to accept it. 
tell yourself that it makes sense. I feel like even that alone is like a lot of work. Yeah. Right. Especially with Mm -hmm. certain situations and certain feelings. Like, I don't know if you're feeling guilt or something like that. Who's going to be like, no, no, no. It's fine. Like, (laughs) you're good. It's possible. It's fine. I'm valid for feeling like it's uncomfortable. Um, Again, you have to, I, you have to feel it and see it. You have to identify the emotion, actually what it is, the goals of the emotion, what it's trying to communicate to you. What do I want here? Is this primary? Do I feel like there's um, maybe judgments in this or maybe not? I have to have relationship mindfulness if I'm going to communicate something to my friend who's late to meet me out to dinner. We really do care about each other. So is this a good time to talk? Am I ready? Are they ready? Are they open? Lots of things to consider, and I got rid of this for space. There's a lot more to consider, too. And then, again, accurate expression of your emotion. Describe it. Describe your goals, feeling, um, how you physically feel it sometimes. Not all of this has to be said out loud to the person, but you yourself need to have an understanding of this, again, at least a little bit to be able to feel it, be one with that experience, and then express it in whatever way feels genuine and doable and safe to you given the person you're expressing it to. You cannot expect someone to accurately express their emotion if they can't manage it or identify what it is. So if you, or maybe someone you know has talked about it like this, if you've ever known like, I'm feeling something, I'm definitely having an emotion, it's probably really uncomfortable. I just don't know what it is. That kind of a feeling, very normal, same. How can you accurately express an emotion that you're not totally sure what it is, right? So you have to really, it's like so many skills, guys. It's like so many skills. Um, All the skills. All the skills. All all of them. Yeah. But awareness, yeah, definitely. The one to start with. It's like so many. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you have to like name it to tame it. You have to see the thing to be able to do anything else with it, so um all right as always questions or anything throw them right there in the chat I just I'm gonna pause myself for a second to make sure I did not forget anything um okay I think I wrote again like in my personal notes here I didn't write it like the um math equation emotion plus judgments equals not primary But that's like a big thing that I wanted to stress here. And again, I think last like super formal piece is you, your loved one, whoever the person is that you care about, again, whether it's yourself or someone else, whatever emotion that you slash they are feeling, whether it's primary or secondary or wherever it's coming from, it is valid. No matter what, you are having it. It's happening. The last thing I think that you want to, hopefully, the last thing you want to do <clears throat> is ignore it or tell yourself no 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 this is secondary I'm crazy I really shouldn't be feeling this way you are it is okay we have all been there I might be there like later today who knows like it's totally fine you just need to again be aware of it know what it looks like for you learn skills use skills this is a big thing this is a big day here but mm-hmm. just keep in mind all emotions are valid every single time so I'm thinking like you trust your body to breathe for you, especially when you're sleeping and you're not awake for it. You just like go to sleep and know that your body's going to keep breathing, right? So you trust your body to do that. Why not trust your body to have these emotions too? And you can use all these skills and make all these changes and do whatever you need to do to stay with your primary emotion as much as possible. But again, you're still feeling the secondary if that's what it is. All right, Jacqueline said no questions come to mind. I'm trusting that if anyone else has questions, they will let us know. Quick, like, disclaimer, a few things to address. I feel like I kept saying it. It's a lot of information. I told you. It's like a four-day training. I'm trying my very best to condense in one hour without making things too, too overwhelming, without bombarding you guys with information and terminology and all of that kind of stuff. And there really is, like, this is just the two main key players, the transactional model and relationship mindfulness that I pulled apart from this. There's a lot of parts to it and so many skills woven into it. Um, 
and it's going to take support, patience, communication, honesty, time. I could have kept going. I was like, that's a long enough. That's a long enough list. It's going to take a lot. It's going to take a whole lot of things. So if you are willing or open to taking the first step or asking your family member to take the first step with you, that is a great first step to take. All right. Lastly here, as promised, my email address again. Questions in the chat. If anything comes up later, again, everyone's going to be sent this. So in your free time, like as you're driving to the beach or something, if you decide to listen to this again um, and questions come up, send me an email. Happy to talk it through, answer any questions you might have. Um, cool. And I think that's everything. So, Kaylin, why don't you not log off immediately, but everyone else, thank you so much for coming. You are welcome, Jacqueline. See you at TCF. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Have a good